don't know. Just ten. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'll tell you something about non-homogeneous quantum turbulence. So there have been people involved in this project, but it's the work of M. Rickinson, who unfortunately is not here today. So you've seen many examples of quantum turbulence uh, during the previous week and uh, more this morning. So I start from the observation that in some experiments in liquid helium, the turbulence does not feel has shown you a picture from a paper by Bradley and collaborators uh, in which uh, artistically uh, you saw a small vibrating wire of the kind they used in Lancaster, which is depicted here, and some kind of cloud of hair, of vortices, uh, around the top of the vibrating wire. But this situation, sorry, keeps cutting. This situation actually uh, is not uncommon. For example, there have been years ago experiments in which quantum turbulence was produced using focus using ultrasound, focusing ultrasound to the center of the mental cell away from boundaries. And then there is a small industry in which uh, turbulence is produced by vibrating objects. For example, uh, the vibrating fork, which you have inside watches, uh, the wires, of course, or a small mesh paddle, essentially, uh, like in this figure, again in Lancaster, but not only in Lancaster, and uh, vibrati vibrating spheres, for example, in Germany, in Regensburg, there was an experiment with an oscillating sphere, superconducting sphere, levitated, very small sphere. So, another situation in which the turbulence is not homogeneous, uh, of course, if you, if you have, for example, uh, some kind of high energy particles in, in, in your liquid uh, helium sample and depositing the, the energy, heating up helium, producing helium-1 and also gas, which then cools quickly, then you have uh, a region of turbulence locally. Or, as I shall describe at the end, if you stick uh, a, a wire inside the liquid sample and uh, pass a current dissipating heat. So this kind of hot wire is uh, at the base of uh, anemometry, so the famous wire technique to measure velocity fluctuations. So in all cases, the turbulence does not fill the experimental cell, although in some cases it's quite interesting that we don't know whether that happens or not. It's still an open question. So in general, the problem which I define is, the prototype problem is what happens if you have a random configuration which are, which are in the middle of your domain, which is very, very large, uh, say infinite, okay? So thus, the quantum turbulence spread in space, diffusing out? That's a very simple question which I'm addressing. Okay, so um, I want to start by illustrating uh, this case, and I'll show some pictures and then animation. So consider two-dimensional turbulence um, realized simply by uh, vortex points. So that's something which undergraduate students can do very well. So we have the x y the complex x y plane, and we have positive or negative vortices, circulation being plus or minus one, an equal number of positive and negative vortices, as that there is no net uh, polarity. Here the vortices are as um, red uh, triangles and blue circles to distinguish the plus from the minus, and this is an initial configuration, random, and really. Um, we just compute the motion, it's very simple, uh, making care that the, taking care that the energy is conserved. It's actually quite interesting. And it's presented in this thick, um, so all the vortices, positive and negative ones, will essentially move under 
each other's influence. There are no annihilation to the actions here unless you want to put them in uh, algorithmically. Now, it will happen eventually uh, that a vortex will come very close to an anti-vortex, forming essentially vortex, anti-vortex pair or dipole. It will, it will happen actually <laughs> very often. But imagine that in this cloud of turbulence, this event takes place uh, somehow in the outer region of the cloud. Also, imagine that the orientation vortex anti vortex pair is such that the resulting translational motion is moving out of the cloud rather than in. Because if the anti vortex pair moves in, it will come back and interact strongly with the other vortices. If it moves out, it doesn't matter. And uh, really, there's nothing in the system which can stop these two vortices, the minus vortex married together from actually living happily thereafter here into infinity very quickly because the speed is inversely proportional to the, their separation. So in this numerical, in this picture, which was taken from a numerical simulation, um, we have added these comet tails representing the trajectories but fading in the past so as not to confuse the picture too much. So for example, see that uh, so with the red triangles and the blue circles, positive and, and negative. And uh, these two objects uh, are a plus and a minus, which have actually which came in from the, from the which visualizes this uh, system. Uh, there is no hard boundary here. It's just the square, which you see. Yeah. So indeed, actually, um, we have labeled with empty symbols, blue and red, these uh, very, very easily, uh, the, these pairs which can be uh, identified algorithmically, okay? So when a vortex pair escapes, it removes uh, energy momentum, angle momentum, it removes a uh, number of points, dimensions length, from the uh, original vortex configuration. Now in the original vortex configuration, you could define some kind of average distance between the vortices. So having lost one pair, we have increased this distance and essentially facilitated the probability for the next pair to escape. So you see a process in which more and more pairs escape. So to clarify this, I have a little animation which I can show you. So the plus and minus vortices are moving around each other, interacting, and you see these escaping dipoles. Okay. So it seems to be quite generic um, in uh, in similar vortex configurations. So the essentially the distinction between the uh, and vortex and the vortex pair and these escaping dipoles. You can also consider the same problem in three dimensions. So rather than vortex and the vortex initially put randomly in the middle of your domain, we can distribute some uh, vortex loops, vortex rings, uh, and we can actually decide to to put them inside some kind of spherical region and assign either the same radius to everybody or provide like a normal distribution of radii, randomize the solid angles to randomize the orientation and actually uh, consider what happens afterwards. How does the system evolve? And here, here are some snapshots. We have actually colored rings differently. So there is much more here because we are in three dimensions, so in particular, we can have reconnections. Um, in two dimensions, we can only have annotations. Um, reconnections. So the number of loops, of closed loops, which was initially set, are uh, changing because new loops can be So loops can also merge. So there are, you will see also lots of Kelvin ways, of the um, 
uh, shape of the vortex loops, for example, this loop here has the shape of this kind of um, M equal to kind of can mode, like a, like some biscuits, so oscillate in this fashion and as it flies away. But the same process takes place. So the tangles fragments move off, losing pairs, and as in two dimensions, together with the scape of the pairs, there is also something else to notice. The vortices which we are not we have identified clearly as pairs, the main cluster of vortices, slowly gets larger and larger. Okay, you see it here, it moves out in 2D but also in 3D. Well, you always conserve, conserve the energy at equal zero. We, yeah, we, we so th this is uh, conservation of energy or not is something which is, is an extra choice. So are we thinking of this problem at zero temperature? So essentially we need to conserve energy for sure. Or are we considering this problem some room zero temperature? Then some energy will be lost. It depends. But this is generic irrespective of temperature. You always see that unless the temperature is so high that you're damping out uh, all these pairs. Okay? Yeah. So we can choose to do it. So I think you the message is clear, but yep. Okay, a web you can actually do this, tackle this problem, considering a zero total polarity, say, rather than I use the term polarity rather than vorticity or not. Uh, it's your choice. So everything which I present here has to do with condition in which there is in two dimensions the same number of plus vortices as minus vortices. So essentially the cluster, the, the vortex configuration does not try to rotate. It's not we, we don't add that extra parameter to, to be included. But of course I can actually include it if I want. And you see and you get an extra rotation. Well, you will see the same effect unless all vor almost all vortices have the same size. You will see essentially the same effect. So these features, uh, the fact that there is a cluster, the fact that there are dipoles or vortex anti vortex pair or small vortex rings which form and fly out, and the rest of the vortex configuration, what I call the main cluster hereafter, slowly spreads, is very, very generic. It does not depend on which dimension, two or three, does not depend on having more or less dissipation. It's a genetic feature. Yeah, well, of course, if introduce uh, enough damping, we don't emit vortex loops. I'll show you an example, in fact, in a moment. But first I want to, so I'm looking for a movie. Here it is. So this is the typical three-dimensional case. So the initial system fragments. We have these evaporating vortex loops. They fly all over. Um, this is actually this uh, simulation is done very temperature, essentially zero temperature. But of course, there is a bit of numerical dissipation which is left because of the way we perform the vortex reconnections. And you will notice that there are indeed very tiny vortex loops compared to the initial uh, size of the cluster. If we increase the temperature and add uh, friction with some background normal fluid, then these tiny loops will actually vanish quite qu quickly. If the temperature is higher, we dump out uh, the loops even faster. Here it is inf it's open. But again, it makes no, not a big difference, provided your system is sufficient. It's a bit, uh, need to think carefully about what is meant 
it is y from calculation right let's go back okay so we can as i said uh, we can divide um, the vortices in evaporating loops evaporating vortex rings or uh, loops or vortex anti vortex pair and main cluster and how do we do the identification uh, it's quite arbitrary how we do it various techniques work but essentially they're based on the relative distance between the vortex and the anti vortex the speed are ev compared to the other typical uh, length scales in the system like the average distance between vortices the average speeds also the orientation vector the direction vector so it's not however it's not difficult to find these pairs so the point which um, the, 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 um, the fact that there are these evaporating pairs was noticed actually was noticed some time ago almost 20 years ago actually uh, but now I want to draw attention to the main cluster okay because that cluster the vortices which are left if we neglect the evaporating pairs which move away that main cluster also spreads although it is much more slower so the question is how do you spread in space um, because at first sight it looks as if uh, we we are facing some kind of diffusion spatial diffusion problem of the kind which is right by the heat equation Indeed, for a viscous fluid, the vorticity would obey some kind of similar equation, um, where the diffusion coefficient, the role of the diffusion coefficient is played by the uh, kinematic viscosity. But here we don't have any uh, viscosity because we're dealing with quantum vortices. Uh, we have an inviscid system. We have a fluid without viscosity. So the question is, are really are we really seeing some uh, spatial diffusion if there is a diffusion can we define an, e an effective viscosity which i refer to as nu prime uh, since nu is the symbol commonly used for kinematic viscosity now a kinematic viscosity has a dimension of a distance squared divided by time so it in this problem look at the units of this effective viscosity in uh, to look at this value in, in units of the quantum of circulation kappa spread yeah okay we come to this point <laughs> now before actually addressing this question we need to to uh, decide or try to understand which kind of uh, turbulent motion is, is represented by our vortex loops or vortex points in 2D. Now this system by construction is very inhomogeneous and all and so are the systems which uh, uh, I find in the experiments. Uh, so it's not actually a very good an ideal system to, to look to look for velocity spectra, energy spectra shown by Andrew Bagley minutes ago. So uh, we had uh, vortex configuration driven, uh, driven in a large domain by these um, uh, MHD flows, input energy lamp at large scales. And indeed, in those cases, cases uh, if you compute the energy spectrum, you see some, um, uh, some uh, distribution of the kinetic energy, which is consistent with the Kolmogorov scaling, although it does not extend over very large case space. In this it's not the case. We have to do everything which I'm describing now has to do with smaller vortex. King. So it's better than the spectrum. One should look at the velocity correlation function, which is written there for the, trans the transverse velocity correlation function, and see how it decays with the typical length scales, uh, which are in the problem, which are the size of the system and the average distance between vortices. So in this case, in which the turbulence seems to be of uh, Vinan kind, so Vinan turbulence, classical Kolmogorov turbulence, because this coefficient, this uh, correlation function decays rather quickly. So, how do we try to compute an effective viscosity? Well, one way to proceed is simply to look at the, um, the fate of the trajectories of 
vortex points or vortex, uh, vort um, essentially how much deviate away from the initial condition. So we can this RMS displacement using coming over vortex points or vortex loops, and then see whether we can define a diffusion diffusion coefficient at a random walk of this divided by the time. Okay, um, now depending on the system, the number of work points or loops uh, is constant. It is constant in the, of, uh, the, in the simplest case, the, vort the vortex points on the complex plane, but uh, it need not be if we decide to form any lens, if we add the dissipation, uh, which makes a uh, vor and vortex and anti vortex eventually to equals to each other and then we remove them. So, so using this formula, what do we get? And here are the results. So these are, which are uh, averages over many ensembles. See, typically, this RMS distance, how it changes with time on a log-log scale. So initially, there is some kind of linear behavior. It's ballistic. So it's, uh, the RMS distance grows linearly with time. But if you wait a bit, then it starts going like the square root. So we have actually some kind of diffusion, uh, which you see in this plot. So the, which distance? The, the initial distance, with yeah, it's defined for each vortex. Yeah, okay, this is in three dimensions. In two dimensions, is, uh, the use of this formula is very simple. In three dimensions, it is more delicate. And that the reason is the Lagrangian uh, technique, which we use to uh, e evolve in time at the abuse of our law. So the number of discretization points is not fixed. We adjust it depending on the local curvature. So we, ne we need actually to do some interpolation. We tend to follow the same fluid uh, particle uh, on, on the core of the vortex. That's right. So, so as I said before, we removed, we totally removed from the analysis the evaporating um, objects. Why? Because clearly they obey some kind of different behavior, they move very fast, and they do not, once they move out, they do not collide with the rest of the vortices, exchange impulse, okay? That's the physical reason. So we think we need to separate them out. So this other graph shows then what is the effective diffusion coefficient as we compute it um, in units of the quantum of circulation. So you see that, uh, so this is for three-dimensional system, an infinite space, prime divided by kappa seems to tend to 0.5. And of course, it's important to remove, uh, to remove the dipoles. So the exercise of identifying actually the loops, so the in three dimensions, they are not simply uh, dipoles. You have to think, OK, wh what are There will be small rings or very wobbly, twisted rings, but very concentrated, fast moving. So it, there is a bit of. Uh, arbitrarily in the definition, but it's not difficult to do this distinction between the main cluster and the evaporating dipoles. So, uh, this value of the effective kinematic viscosity in units of the quantum circulation seems to be there. This buff 0.53, and it doesn't matter whether we have a rather, uh, we have a vortex tangle with a, a sort of very intense vortex tangle or less intense vortex tangle. Here there are pulse for for two different vortex line densities, one double the size of the other. Oh, that is it's a, the, the game of uh, checking whether you've removed uh, uh, the sufficiently small vortex loop. Okay. Yes, because we have. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, so far, we are considering infinite domains, so. So the, the vortices keep moving, okay? 
Yeah, it's the interaction. When they start, the, is the vortex start interacting, colliding. But of course, the collision between vortex loop within a tangle is not uh, precisely defined because the, the range uh, of interaction is, is of the vortices is, is not. No, it's rather fast. If, if you see in the, you move you move away from the holistic regime. Okay, so. So we have this diffusion coefficient. So there actually have been attempts to to get it previous previous work. So there is a Nemirovsky years ago, um, and he came up with this prediction of prime of a kappa, which is more than two. Uh, so that is actually it was not a numerical simulation; it was a theory. But really, there he assumed some diffusion process from the very start. So. He assumed what actually we discover. Um, so there are which are built in. Also, it was based on uh, rings, really. And here I want to point out that uh, although it's quite convenient, we do it all the time, it has been done often, to think of a vortex tangle as somehow a collection of vortex loops, hence vortex rings, which are circular loops. Uh, this is only true in some qualitative sense, because if you look at the snapshot of this expanding vortex configurations. Yes, you do recognize loops. For example, here there is an evaporating vortex loop, clearly. Yeah. You can define the average curvature, and it will make sense. You can actually describe the dynamics in terms of an average curvature, and it works pretty well in a sense. But really, uh, as Andrew has shown you, uh, there are clearly objects which are much more than loops, like uh, this this is a single line. The black is a single vortex line, which is some um, monster knot, which happens to be there at that moment. So there are more than loops. So it's not that surprising that uh, Nemirovsky's theory based on future loops is not actually quantitative correct. There was another attempt years ago to come to this uh, idea of a, an effective diffusion. It was an interesting ex numerical exercise by Subota, his student Araki, and Giovanni. So what they did, they computed turbulence in counterflow, turbulence generated by a heat flux in a channel. And uh, that was in a periodic box. So when they reached some statistical steady state, they removed all the vortices from half of the box, and then they continued the calculation to see how the many vortices would drift to the empty side. Now, this turbulence, however, this calculation used the law of induction approximation rather than the views of our law. So it, it has its own limitation. It's in the case of counterflow, that may actually lead to some artificial effects, something like um, the creation of layers of uh, vortices. It does not seem to be the case here, but it is an approximation. Also, the turbulence. The counterflow turbulence actually is not entirely, it's not isotropic. It is mildly flattened in the direction perpendicular to the applied heat flux. So we're for perhaps it's not the same kind of turbulence as we see. Uh, and there is another feature. The way they tried to extract this uh, diffusion coefficient was via that equation. Now, that equation is the modification of the somewhat well-known equation of in the literature, the Vinan equation for the vortex line density, L, the length of vortex line per unit volume. So that was written by Joe Vinan many years ago. So he argued that um, the rate of change of the vortex line density depends on two terms, a creation term and a destruction term, essentially some kind of master equation. And he came up with some ideas about these two terms. And in this case, we have no creation. There is only destructions. And the destruction term, which is left, has a minus sign. And it is proportional to L, L squared. Okay. So, so far, so good. Um, they added uh, this extra term, Laplacian of L, with some diffusion coefficient. Now, this equation actually um, is a it's a good idea, but actually it's not, uh, there, there is not a derivation of this equation from vortex dynamics for anything. It's just a thought. So again, we assume a diffusion process, and we try to recover the new prime. Another difficulty is that 
By doing so, one has to guess what is the that parameter chi2, which is on, on the first term on the right hand side. Um, both the generation term and the destruction term in the master equation, in Vinus equation, contain these dimensionless parameters chi1 and chi2. It's well known what is the ratio of chi1 and chi2, but to get chi2 independently takes an effort. So they had to do separate numerical simulation to recover chi2 and then fit the data, fit this slow spread, and obtain new prime, which is 0 0.1. I forgot to say that's in units of kappa. So it's actually a value which is much less, about five times less than what we, what we had. I must also add that in this process, uh, they did not remove the evaporating loops. They are included. So they are included in, uh, in uh, the, the, the fitting operation. In the, if we try to apply the method of Zubota and collaborators in our problem, we have to <laughs> proceed along the same lines. We have to find out what is, is a coefficient chi2 and which we can do. Um, we did it, I think, rather precisely, taking into account some mild nonlinearities in chi2. And uh, we do this fitting, and we get something which is bigger than what they did, 0 0.28, still much less than what we obtained, which is about 0.4. Then what we can do to see whether we meet them, we can actually neglect the distinction between evaporating loops and the main cluster, and we get another number. So it's less. We are going in the direction of their value now. Um, so overall, um, it seems better, actually, to use the RMS deviation as a measure of uh, this diffusion, this effective diff diffusion coefficient, uh, because there is no arbitrarity uh, in, um, the essentially, there is not a parameter chi2, which is necessary to, to do this uh, exercise. Uh, which we don't know actually independently. And also, our procedure seems to be independent of, of vortex line density, whereas this seems to depend on the vortex line density. But we are sort of perhaps splitting small details. Okay? So the difference is a factor of five. So, overall, that's the conclusion. We have this effective diffusion, which is 0.5. Now, what happens? Can we actually do this problem in an atomic condensate? So we can repeat the calculation for the gross pitesque equation. For example, at t equals 0, then, of course, we don't have, we cannot do this in an infinite box. We have to assign the sign of the box. Of the box. Indeed, the experiments have quite limited um, available size for the condensate. So you see here some results. We have, in this case, a circular domain. It's a box trap. So the density is not, is uniform, like uh, so near never. Okay? Uh, it's a box trap of this kind, which uh, clearly goes in the, in, in the direction of making contact with liquid helium. So we have our condition, the vortices is spread. Also another effect which comes into the problem now, it is sound waves which are generated, which you see here, these uh, gray, dark gray and light gray uh, waves. So it's part of the dynamics now. Also here, the reconnections do exist, annihilations take place. So if we start with n vortices, after a while we have less because the annihilation vortices hitting anti-vortices. Okay. Uh, but it does not seem that the uh, waves make a significant effect. It's more actually the fact that the system is confined because new prime of a kappa which we get is actually a bit less than what we get in infinite domains, even if we use the point method can do in a circular or square domain. So that is most important, more than the sound wave. Okay. Still, it would be nice if uh, one could verify experimentally that there is diffusion, uh, essentially, of the with the coefficients of the order of the quantum configuration in some kind of trapped condensate. There is also a possible snag, which is the following. Uh, let's see, what is the light? No, th this is equal zero now. Okay, okay. You, yeah, you asked this again. I promise I would answer. If you if you increase the temperature, essentially you have friction of the quantum vortices with the background thermal cloud or normal fluid. So the first thing which we will notice is that 
the vortex loops which move away fast from the main cluster shrink very quickly. Okay? That is the fact of the future. So you lose you will lose the evaporating vortex loops. Why? Because they move fast. So the friction acts on the relative velocity difference between the superfluid vortices and the background normal fluid. So that is where the friction will bite. The friction will destroy the evaporating loops very quickly. You will remember the movie shown by Andrew Bagley in which in three dimensions there is a vortex tangle and there are actually some loops moving out but vanishing, killed by friction. So, no friction is not some non-zero temperature, okay? Yeah. A zero temperature, there is no friction, the vortex loop will travel. They will still lose, it's still an energy loss because because the system, uh, because the vortices will radiate sound. Now, circular vortex rings will not radiate sound, but if the loops are non-circular, for example, they are slightly elliptical, they will actually move like this, and this motion radiates. So there is an energy loss, which on the long run will make them to become smaller and smaller and smaller. So how fast? It depends on the, the, the temperature which That I don't know yeah, the answer to your question. I'm simply saying that the friction will, first of all, remove from the problem the evaporating loops. Yeah. Not the motion of the main cluster will not be affected unless the, the friction is significant, simply because it's somewhat slower. Okay. But eventually that will be affected by friction too. Okay. So what I was saying is, oh yeah, for the light. Is there? Is there a no. Mm. Well, I hope you can see the board. If you have a confined, a confined condensate, for example, and uh, you have a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair here, which travels towards the the uh, the edge of the condensate, the edge of the box trap, what happens? Well, at some point. The vortices will perceive the end of the, the images, if you want, and uh, they will actually do this. They have to conserve energy by expanding out, and then they will move out separately. Uh, if you think, if you can think that each vortex perceives the, its own image across the boundary and travels with the image, so you will see something like this. Okay. Well. Uh, what happens? The vortices then will meet again, and they will travel back into the condensate. Or they may meet, suppose there is another vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair going towards the edge. So the same effect here, they will meet another vortex traveling along the edge and into the system. Um, now you may worry about that because that will prevent, essentially, uh, that effect coming from the boundary will keep re-injecting the, the evaporating vortex loops, which you would like to neglect to compute the effective viscosity. Okay, but this is not a problem because um, any residual thermal cloud will. <laughs> so, okay, here there are GP calculations showing here a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair, a very tight vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair, reaching the boundary of this box trap condensate here. At that point, the, the vortex and the anti-vortex separate, as you see the two dots, traveling away. So you have the possible problem of, of these vortices near the edge, which meeting other vortices, which ended up near the edge, can re-enter the condensate. But as I said, um, there is a bit of dissipation called by the thermal cloud near the edge, then the vortex anti vortex pair will disappear. So, in this case, it actually disappears making some sound because the effect was very, very small. The thermal effect was very small. Why should there be a dissipation near the edge? Because we know from uh, simulations of this kind uh, that um, here you see, for example, a, vort a single vortex processing in a harmonic trap 
the first row shows the condensate with the hole, the blue dot is the vortex. Blue means no density of the condensate, so it's moving around. And in the second, the bottom row, you see actually th the thermal cloud. You see that it is concentrated near, near the edge. So provided the temperature is not too small, then you can get rid of, uh, of this problem of possible reinjection. Right, I'm coming to the end, and I want just to point out that there is a problem of diffusion, which we are considering at the moment, which is the problem of the hot fires. So this is a very simple experimental setup in liquid helium, which strangely was not, has not been considered. So imagine you simply put a wire and pass a current through it. It will become warmer. Um, heat will create a radial counterflow. So um, in, in counterflow is the most uh, used uh, way to generate turbulence in liquid helium historically, but the heat was always essentially a wall of a channel, not in, in the middle of the channel. So you see hot wire, and you see this kind of turbulence which is generated. So it's a very non-homogeneous turbulence in which there is a tangle which is localized near the wire. So this is a side view, and this is a view from the top. So the radial counterflow is this. There is normal fluid carrying the heat which moves out radially, and a superfluid coming in to compensate and maintain zero mass flux. Now, if you have a, like a tangle of vortices, if you picture the dynamics in a simplified fashion as loops, you will have the four vortex loops, which, if oriented out, will, be, will counterflow from the back, which means they will become large, will gain energy, stealing it from the normal fluid, and therefore slow down. So indeed, you see, in this view from the top, you see very large vortex loops, which are moving out but slowing, and then essentially they stop, OK? Or they open up. The vortices which move in will go and be destroyed and reconnect in the extreme intense vortex temple which is generated. So this is an interesting setup because, as I said, it's the basic principle of the hot wire, which uh, in Grenoble, uh, they managed to set up and they made it to work. And uh, I stress that it is extremely hot in their case. So I think they apply pressure to prevent actually the liquid helium from actually becoming gas near the hot wire. Um, so they also moved to perhaps uh, more delicate monitors using cantilevers. But uh, essentially, this setup is interesting per se to study a turbulence which is not homogeneous in space. And at this point, I don't want to prevent you from getting your coffee. So I come to the conclusion. So there seems to be there seems to be this genetic process in which uh, inhomogeneous turbulence behave in this fashion. We have this um, distinction of small vortex and vortex pair, pairs or dipoles. In 2D, in 3D, we have these vortex loops uh, evaporating, leaving behind a cluster which undergoes some diffusion-like process. Essentially, it's like viscosity, viscosity collision, changes of momentum, and vortices do something similar. And if we want to quantify it, we end up with a diffusion coefficient which is essentially the quantum of circulation as an order of magnitude. And here there are two papers in 2D and 3D about this problem. And uh, I'll stop and thank you.